Ladies and gentlemen, we need to continue. We are about to start the next panel, which has a rather provocative title, Unicorns versus Minicorns, and a small intro. 25 uh, billionaires at the Forbes 2016 list uh, made a significant amount of money starting from or above 1 billion. 18 out of those 25 have been younger than 40 years. Actually, their median age is 36. And their businesses are, let's say, quite rare, but extremely successful. And the key problem is that might create a perception that anyone can start from the garage and create a unicorn. And we heard one example uh, during these uh, two days that the son asked father, actually told to the father that uh, starting a garage is a way to make uh, to make money and this this panel is going to try to answer the question uh, Is it better to have a minicorns or unicorns what the minicorns mini, mini are and uh, What actually is the right approach and it is my amazing pleasure to announce a moderator Peter E. Brown uh, Coming from Iban Iban board member Peter, please welcome then, then, Julius Akiniemi, Chairman, Founder and CEO of WWIN Corp USA. Have you here again? And welcome again. You've been here. This is great when you have the same speaker in two hats. It's amazing uh, what experience is giving to all of us. Of course, my dear friend, Miguel Martin, Founder and Co-Investor at Emerging Hub Spain and WBAF High Commissioner for Spain. Miguel, please, the floor is yours. And le last but not least, of course, Sergio Vella, Director of Financing and Investor Relations at ISEX Invest in Spain. Welcome. Gentlemen, the floor is yours. Welcome to this very interesting, hopefully, panel and shedding some light on unicorns or not unicorns. Um, my name is Peter Braun. I'm uh, serving at the board of IBAN for eight years now. I have to admit, I have not built a unicorn. My biggest success was half a unicorn uh, with an IPO in the States. Um, so, not so bad, but. I think what we have to look at today with my distinguished panelists here is what is really happening and what are success factors that we have. And uh, very, very interesting is uh, one fact to set the floor a little bit. Uh, in 2014, in China, we had about eight unicorns. In 2018, we had 56. Um, in the EU, all of Europe, seven. In Indonesia, India and Africa, one each. So this is about the dynamics that we're looking at. And of course, the 10 biggest unicorns um, are between the US and China. US six, China four, about to change, of course. And the total volume of these 10 largest companies is about 300 billion uh, US dollars. All the other 204 accumulate to about 440. So it's not about baffling you with the numbers, but the speed in which we see unicorns being built, and it's not happening here, and what do we have to do, or what do we choose to do better, this is what we are going to to talk about with uh, Julius, Miguel, and Sergio. So, gentlemen, f maybe I could ask you to, to introduce yourself really quickly, what your background is, and um, what is a unicorn for you? Just a quick statement. What do you associate with that? Please. Shall we sh uh, start with you, Julius? Uh, my name is Julius Akinyemi. I'm from MIT Media Lab. I'm also the founder 
and chair of uh, UN COP, which is Unleashing the Wealth of Nations, and I will talk a little bit about that uh, later on. So um, I won't repeat, even though MIT is notorious for data and mathematics, but I won't repeat what you already said, that's obvious. Um, when we look at the last couple of years, uh, what we find in the uh, business environment is uh, the fact that we are having a future, and I will kind of go straight to what I have in mind in, in a minute. We have a future that is coming to us faster than we ever had before. Uh, because, and what's driving that is technology in all facets. You know, it could be you know, your AI, deep learning, uh, I mean, IoT, and so on. But if you look at all these unicorns that we just talked about, uh, within the last decade, you will find out that they are all driven by technology. Technology that is coming to us a lot faster than we can ever imagine. And when you look below that, you find out that they are building platforms. And when I say platforms, platforms that are not specific. And they are not specific in the sense that they are not coded to a specific performance. They are built to be uh, uh, malleable. You can mold them, you can uh, uh, take them to, you know, if you take uh, Uber, for example, okay? I mean, it's not just about you know, uh, uh, having a taxi or whatever. Now you have Uber delivery, uh, you know, and it goes on and on and on. So these are platforms that are scalable. There are platforms that are well thought out in terms of architecture. You have to have the architecture that scales. And that's what is driving uh, uh, the unicorns today. And of course, you know, uh, timing is critical, the time you get to market. And uh, knowing your market and knowing the need of the market, it, it, all of those older uh, uh, um, stables in the marketplace, they still come to play. But the only thing is the, the technology driving them, they are, I mean, they are being developed at a faster speed than we ever thought before. So these are the things we need to keep in mind, and this is how, uh, and I even believe that the, the future is going to be even faster than we ever thought before. So this is what is driving the unicorns. My only caution will be for each one of them, you know, as we always do, uh, we have to be careful. We have to be careful that we don't run into a bubble. We have to be careful uh, that we are not looking at them from investment point of view in terms of overly pricing them and then not realizing the intrinsic value. Again, I can go deeper into some of this in a minute, but uh, I just want to try the top level idea. There is an intrinsic value in each of the companies. You don't want to make the intrinsic value uh, uh, bloated in a sense that they cannot sustain themselves. So let me leave that as is, and then uh, we can talk deeper about that in a minute. Very good, Julius. Thank you very much. Now we in Europe uh, have good research. We invest Our, oh, thank you. <laughs> our education, it's so loud, our education system is probably not catching up with the speed that you just mentioned. And uh, so when we produce research, we have a lot of knowledge, but how do we monetize on that? And maybe I hand over Miguel to you, looking at Spain a little bit and the ecosystem uh, that is being built there. Maybe you'll give a little bit of background for you, your role, and also how you deploy your government funds to help create entrepreneurship. Uh, perfect. But I think that we have a much better person for that to talk about the institutional Spanish ecosystem, which uh, Sergio, who is responsible for the Spanish Sport and Investment Promotion Agency, so I, I pass to Sergio that, uh, to talk about the, the Spanish ecosystem and I will continue with any other questions. But then please give us your background, Miguel. What, okay. what are sorry, your sorry, responsibilities? Sorry. Okay. That's fine. Yeah, um, well, my background is um, basically I'm a Syrian entrepreneur and uh, I've been investing in startups for the last six or five, five or six years, uh, mainly in the, in the sectors and 
verticals and where I have a previous experience. Uh, basically, I've been working in the, during 15 years in the, around eight international countries um, in, in education, real estate, and new media. Um, uh, I'm the co-founder uh, of uh, Immersion Hub, which is a special uh, ecosystem uh, d dedicated to train and uh, promote uh, startups in the, with virtual reality, augmented reality, and immersive technologies. Thank you very much. And then, Sergio, if you would please also give us your background briefly, and yes. then if you would answer maybe my question about what do you see as being drivers for the Spanish ecosystem. Thank you. Thank you. I will be happy to answer that. Uh, well, my name is Sergio Vela. I'm the Director of Finance and Investor Relations at IFEX Invest in Spain. For those of you who are not acquainted with this institution, I would say this is a public corporation entity which belongs to the Ministry of Industry, Trade and, Com and, and Tourism in Spain and whose main aim is to support companies, Spanish companies, in their uh, interna internationalization process and attracting FDI. And that's what we do specifically in Invest in Spain, attracting FDI. We do so, so by two means. First, uh, we provide international investors with personalized advisory services in all those issues that could be key in their decision making. And we can uh, arrange uh, some kind of agenda for them with both public institutions or private partners. Uh, we have our network of relation with all levels and of governments, even local and regional. And the other mean, the other part of our duty is to support also the Spanish companies when they are looking for a partner for their business to grow. So we are providing them with connectivity. We are providing them, we are connecting them to international investors. And for that, we have the support of 100 or more economic and commercial offices around the world in the embassies. Uh, that's what I would do right now. In fact, what we have here is a delegation of seven companies, which are right now, have been in the pitching session. So I hope you have had the chance to hear them. And as for the ecosystem, well, I have also to say that I'm only three months in this position, and my previous background is more about international economics and promoting export. But I can tell you a little bit about the ecosystem right now. Uh, just a few facts and figures. Uh, investment, venture capital investment in Spain has been at record levels for the last two years, has been around 500 million euros, and we're talking about 560 operations, projects. We should be talking right now about 3,400 startups. And the number of startups that completed uh, funding rounds of more than 10 million euros, more than doubled in 2017, and it's running very fast for those who have gone for more than 25 million. Uh, in 2017, we had assets worth more than $1 billion. And we should say that, according to the Atomico report, Spain is one of the most promising countries right now for three reasons, I would say. First is the pool of developers, since uh, according to Atomico, Turkey, Russia, and Spain are the ones who are uh, running the most of the, this pool of developers. Second, because Spain is ranked third of the top 10 U.S. destinations for intra-European movers on the tech uh, industry. And third, because we have two clear innovation hubs like Madrid and Barcelona. And I, 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 <laughs> I don't agree with that. Well, uh, this is according to Atomico, but I was going to tell okay. that this is Atomico, but we, as we are seeing today and here that we also have Sevilla and Malaga and much more uh, uh, hubs. But according to Atomico, this, and all these hubs, I think the main reason for all this is, uh, well, we have excellent business and engineering universities. We have, uh, of course, a uh, good quality of life. And we have a very highly professional uh, skilled uh, people at very low cost. According to Atomico, uh, the cost, uh, the average salary for a software engineer in Madrid 
it's uh, $36,000, and in Barcelona it's $40,000. That's way below other European destinations. And we also have an uh, advantage in when looking for offices because the prime rent in Madrid, which is the most expensive place in, in Spain, is like three times cheaper than London, two times cheaper than Paris, and 1.2 times cheaper than Frankfurt. So as a nutshell, you can see Spain is growing very fast. And I don't know if you want me to, ask right now, to answer right now to the question of unicorns or Well, yeah, the, the point is, um, and the point of our discussion is, should we build unicorns and try to aim at the big, big companies that are worth a billion or more? Or is it better, I think, what you're aiming at, to build more companies that maybe don't reach that level, but uh, make sure that you have employment and so on? Now, let me be a little bit provocative here, because uh, I give you one story. Uh, and it's a true story, and it happened to me four weeks ago. So I'm working with a startup uh, from the US. Uh, I think I cannot mention the company name here, but it's... Uh, uh, an experienced entrepreneur, he has already had some good successes and exits to Microsoft, to AOL, and, and so on. So he told me, well, Peter, we are still raising this, this one uh, round. We're doing right now 10 million uh, US dollar at an 80 million valuation. Okay, I said, that's, that's fair, that sounds reasonable. And then I said, um, and, and what's, your next, uh, what's your next round looking at? He said, yeah, we're going to raise 150. And I said, yeah, you're raising at 150 million valuation. That's not a big step from 80. And he said, no, no, no. We are raising 150 million in our next round. That's their B round. This is in Europe where we would have long exited because we sell our companies way too early for 20 million, for 30 million, for 40 million, and we think that's a success. That's an A round in the Silicon Valley. And this is where we lose track. And track, lo losing track has to do with speed. The problem, the other problem, and I just mentioned it and then opened the floor for discussion is, in Europe we try to avoid the risk, so we want to be break even as quickly as possible to be safe. What we're forgetting is we're not scaling quick enough. So we're scaling at a flat rate instead of tanking enough capital to really come out of the gate. So those are two factors, and Julius, you mentioned speed, uh, that will uh, very strongly affect our competitiveness. How do you see this in, in your view, maybe from the US first? Uh, you also have a view on Europe, I'm sure. And then maybe for my other gentlemen panelists, are we not thinking too small in Europe when we have this national approach? So, so, Julius. Um, if, you, if you actually look at the economics, uh, obviously US and Europe are the big, uh, uh, biggest economies of the world, so to speak, if you exclude China for the time being. Um, um, what generally happens is that when you have a startup, uh, you need the supply side of fund that are chasing X number of demand of uh, uh, startups. In the US, you have a lot of supply that is chasing probably relatively fewer, uh, very, very viable, and very, very uh, um, highly promoted startups. And I believe that's why you see the price differential and the timing differential between the US and Europe. I mean, I live in France recently, but so I'm very familiar with both of the markets. Uh, but uh, if you take, um, for, you know, uh, for, for example, uh, purposes, you take MIT Media Lab, okay? Technologies come out of there almost every day. You know, it's, it's, it's a high turnover. Silicon Valley is lining up at, by the door to see the next big thing. And because of that, you know, when you talk about the 20, 40, 50 million uh, uh, um, injured to first round and so on, uh, because you have so much supply and so much uh, um, fewer uh, highly promoted and viable uh, uh, startups, so you have that high speed of people wants to get in. 
As a matter of fact, um, you know, I'll give you a good example. Uh, at MIT, we do what we call the 100 k uh, um, I mean $100,000 uh, price, which is to say it became a very big thing globally. So all of the investors will come in and they want to see the project that is the most viable at MIT. And I was judged on, one, on some of them sometimes. And the, 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 what it has turned to a point where actually the project that wins does not get the glory anymore. Because everybody thinks, oh, OK, that project wins. It gets the 20, 40. You know, even though MIT is only given 100K, by the time that project works out, you have more than a you know, couple of million dollars that is already put on that project. But not only that, the next nine projects that are behind that, they already lined up to, to fund it. So you can just see the turnover uh, you know, because of that. You don't see a lot of that in Europe. And because of that, again, it, it goes to the supply and demand thing. So let me, uh, let me just keep that as is because I don't want to overly uh, uh, promote that. That's not the key of the, of the discussion. So the discussion then becomes, should we be doing things like that, or should we be looking at the many uh, 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 enterprises that don't scale necessarily to the million plus and so on? I, I truly believe we have to have a mixture. When you look at the economy today, most of the under one million, uh, so to speak, uh, uh, enterprises hire more. You know, they, they engage more of the labor you know, in the marketplace than the unicorns. Yes, they are big and they, they still employ uh, a lot of people, no doubt about that. But when you look at the uh, uh, small or medium-sized enterprises, globally or overall, in both of the two markets, they actually employ more. And if you look at the, what I would call the uh, return on social capital, and that I need to redefine, I will define that in some point. Uh, if you look at the return on social capital, meaning capital that is infused into the economic system, and what is the return on it? The mini unicorns have a higher return on social capital than the bigger ones. Therefore, when we look at them, uh, yes, they are big. Yes, they are high revenue. Uh, when you look at the per capita revenue generated by each of those ones, I believe the mini unicorns are far more productive in society than the big ones. Even though overall, I, I should not underscore, overall, yes, they are bigger, they are more productive, more revenue, more taxes. There's no doubt about that. Thank you very much. And Miguel, you wanted to, to add to this uh, from an angel and in serial yeah, entrepreneur I, perspective. Well, first, I wanted to make a, a comment uh, about uh, the Julius uh, last. Uh, um, I, I, went, when I was preparing the, this uh, panel. I discovered an article about uh, Unicorn versus Zebras. <laughs> I don't know if you know what they, they have. Uh, um, Severus, uh, I didn't know about that. And what is qu is quite interesting, even if I agree or not, it's not the question. But Severus is uh, is a real animal. Unicorns are some kind of magical thing. Severus uh, working group. Unicorns are alone. Severus uh, can represent diversity. Uh, unicorns uh, is more how to say white uh, male thing or male or female or whatever. So I, I've, I think that it's very important to consider what is a unicorn for a country in Africa. Uh, maybe a, uh, it's a company that uh, really uh, create jobs and, and give prosperity and, and good, uh, how to say, uh, technology advance for, for the country. And maybe a unicorn in another way is not just a one billion company. In Spain, for example, and with the crisis, we have face a huge problem with the unemployment. Maybe it's better to have 10 or 100 or 1,000 companies than create uh, X number of employments than having an, a company that is valued $1 billion. Uh, uh, but it's only uh, everything is automated, uh, automa uh, is um, made by machines. So uh, of course, uh, every country want to have their own champions and the, to build companies that they are representative of the digital economy, but I think that there the is uh, not, the, not the whole world has the, the same view that we have from uh, Europe or uh, the States. There is a, a much more a diversity views in Latin America, Asia, or Africa. 
Yeah, very, very good points. Thank you very much, Miguel. I want to, to follow on and say, I mean, for us as investors, uh, the most important thing that we do is not invest. It's that we exit. And then we make money and hopefully then we can reinvest. So we have like a circular um, thing going on and we, we invest, of course, as angel investors, not just capital. We invest our time, we invest our passion, we help uh, the entrepreneurs to become successful. Uh, so I, I go again to you, Sergio, with your programs that, you, that you're doing with the startups that you're bringing. I saw them this morning being in the jury, being well-trained, being well-prepared. Um, how do you see the other success factors? Okay, we have created those startups. They're well-trained uh, engineers and, and uh, scientists. Uh, the startup is being created, they get the initial funding from you. You also mentioned you have your international uh, network that you help them introduce them to. Um, what would be a success story for you as uh, from the Spanish perspective, but then maybe also from a European perspective? Uh, is, it, is it employment? Is it that these people um, have jobs in, in, in companies that are uh, tackling the, the newest technology, what is your matrix of success? Well, let me please just add first to the previous question that uh, effectively, as Miguel was saying, I think that in Spain we are not so much, so much focused on unicorns. Uh, we have mainly three public institutions for promoting this kind of uh, ecosystem. First one is Deco, uh, which is a state-owned bank. Uh, this one launched in 2013, uh, Fondico, which is the first fan of funds with public capital. And it happened to, well, since so, we had like nine tenders, and it had invested in 64 fans, both private equity and venture capital. It has invested like 1.4 billion euros, but what is more interesting, it has mobilized 4.6 billion euros affecting 300 companies. We also have CEDETI, which is the Center for Industrial and Technological Development, which also invest, has invested in one private equity fund, 10 venture capital fund, and three seed capital funds. They have invested like two point, uh, 280 million and they have mobilized like 850 million euros. And lastly, but not less important, is uh, the innovation company, Enisa, which has loan, participated loans and since 2005 has, uh, has granted 5,000 of these. So, but the ticket is 165,000. Why I'm telling this? Because as you can see, we are focused at all the stages. We are not so focused on unicorns. We don't want that because we think that uh, make, policy, make unicorn hunted part of policy making can bad wrongly incentivate the venture capital behavior. And it would lead to rash investments. And last time I, well, I read recently that the time it takes a startup to become from the first minute, from the first round of venture capital finance, it has to become a, a unicorn, has fallen from seven years in 2013 to 4.5 in last year. So I'm not sure all the companies can scale at that time. I, I don't know, I, I think it's more the session rather than the rule. So we, 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 we are first, trying to focus, of course, unicorns are very important, of course. We have, a, in a Spanish, we have a say for golf players, which says the drive give you the glory and the path give you the victory. In this case, I think the unicorn will give you the glory and the minicorns will give you the victory. And that's our sense, no? I think right. we should take care of both, we, but we cannot put all the eggs in the same basket. Yeah. I think that's a, that's a very good point. I also want to mention, of course, that. Europe is not a market that is just a homogeneous market like the US. So we have different countries, different languages, different cultures, different behavior in how we purchase in these various countries. So for us to scale from our Spanish 
startup into other European countries is uh, not as easy as if you scale from the West Coast to the East Coast in, in New York. Um, would you see, uh, maybe Miguel first, uh, a necessity to think more uh, international from the get-go when you create a startup? Is it not important that we that we build the startups in such a way that they're not aiming at only the home market, the domestic market, but from the get-go, from the outset, uh, to be able to become, potentially at least, a global company? Yeah, of course. I, I fully agree with what you say. Uh, Europe is very, uh, and there is a huge diversity. Uh, in fact, uh, when I'm talking with many uh, Spanish startups uh, almost every week, the first thing I tell them is to send me all the information in English because it's the only way to share it with the network that we have in the World Business Angel Forum or any opportunity that I have internationally. Um, not, uh, not many, uh, well, some of them they are start to think in that way, but others continue to, to think about more in a local or in a Spanish way, uh, which is, in my opinion, is very limited for them. Um, and they, we should, if, even if they don't have the, how to say, the ability to, to think in, uh, in an international scope, they should uh, take advantage of the, uh, the Spanish, is the, the second or third language more popular in the world. So they will have to develop much more bridges between Latin America and Spain, um, which is, I think, that there is a huge opportunity there. Uh, but of course, I, I fully agree with you that the, any a startup or a company based in digital economy sh should be thinking in, in a global, with a in global thinking. Um, even if the marketing or the strategy to arrive for every local market should be maybe dif a little bit different for approaching them in a, in a uh, how to say it, in the for the specific case scenario uh, of, of the particular market that they are targeting. Excellent, thank you. Uh, I think we have about to finish the panel. Uh, maybe one final question, Julius, in, in your direction. Uh, of course, you're coming from MIT, fantastic school, building out great engineers, but as I know, there's never enough good engineers in the US. And now we have uh, our friends here from Spain and of course from other European countries. I could mention Poland, of course I should mention Turkey, very well educated, good engineers, uh, fantastic programmers. And uh, is it not an option for you to reach out to those talent base? Yeah, absolutely. And actually, uh, if you look at what is going on uh, today, yes, there's the MITs of the world uh, as innovators. They are the, I like to categorize in the sense that you have the uh, inventors of technology that drives our life. And then you have the practitioners, the doers that are really on the ground actually getting things done. That's the businesses that are coming to you proposing solutions for a day-to-day -day activity. So, yes, um, the, what I've experienced so far, uh, given that I'm an entrepreneur myself, uh, some of our development, for example, we are getting some Croatians to do some of our development, even though we have engineers out of MIT. Uh, it's great to have the uh, great institutions of the world that are innovative and create the new platforms of the world. That's why I use the word platform specifically, because it's critical. When you have a platform, you can now have a plug and play from anywhere in the world where you can have developers. And I absolutely agree with you, uh, there are absolutely very, very competent engineers, developers, uh, code writers, all over Europe and around the world. So from that point of view, the world is small. And we have to be able to accommodate and seek uh, uh, competencies globally, as opposed to just make it a, a domain thing. It's not just a specific domain. And if I could also add to your last question, which I, uh, I think is important, when we do this, uh, it, it doesn't, when you scale or when you think about your business, it's not so much of thinking internationally that matters the most. I think what you want to do is to provide a solution uh, that is viable in the marketplace. When you do that, you have to make it flexible enough to scale up to any language, any region, and so on. So, you know, what I will advise is 
the, the focus is not international. The focus of, is on providing a solution. When you provide that solution, that solution should be able to scale. And by being able to scale, then you are automatically addressing the international arena. But if you can't address a specific solution, then nobody's going to buy it. So you don't want to kill yourself before you get started. That's what I would recommend. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, one question from the audience. If not, then I would like to thank my distinguished panelists. Wonderful. Of course, we would not resolve it today, but I think we touched on some important aspects and points. Thank you very much for your insights. I start from uh, Sergio and uh, Miguel and Julius. Excellent. Thank you very much. Big round of applause. Thank you. <laughs>